2011 installment of the Trinity Debates on the campus of Trinity International University. My name is Chris Firestone. I'm an associate professor of philosophy at Trinity and I have served as the regular moderator of the Trinity Debates for the last 10 years. From what I can tell, we have quite a crowd here of people from the campus community as well as individuals from the surrounding areas. I know, for example, my church is represented, North Suburban Church of Deerfield. Thank you guys for coming and supporting us here. Welcome also to people from some of our sister schools in the area. Uh, typically, and I've seen a few people from Moody and, and Wheaton here. It's always nice to see you guys brave the Chicago traffic to get here in an evening uh, like this. I suppose we should have let you know that, uh, that this is being streamed live on the web. And so, <laughs> uh, you know, that's, it's always better to be here, I guess. Uh, I want to welcome the people online as well. I'll do my best to include you guys in the process. I've been given an iPad over here that will hopefully include some of the questions from the people online as well. This debate marks the 10th anniversary of the Trinity Debates. The debates were born out of a partnership between the philosophy department and the honors program at Trinity College and have since migrated their way over to the Henry Center for Theological Understanding. As you can see, the Henry Center has done a wonderful job of putting this together. I want to thank uh, Hans Madumi and Doug Sweeney for, for their support in getting this done. What a, what a wonderful event this is. In the early debates, we zeroed in on the philosophical topics of abiding interest to the Christian community. In the fall of 2002, our debate featured Dr. Cliff Williams and Dr. Keith Yandel and discussed the question whether or not Christians should be substance dualists or pluralists. Subsequent debates featured well-known scholars covering such topics as the problem of God's hiddenness, the philosophy of Immanuel Kant, and their relevance to Christian thought. With the support of the Henry Center, we have begun focusing on debates of increasing relevance to the church. A few years ago, we held a debate on Christianity and religious pluralism. Last year, or was it a year and a half ago, we held a debate on the doctrine of the Trinity. The question is, tonight is as follows. Is social justice an essential part of the mission of the church? This question is deceptively simple. On the one hand, I doubt that many in this room would question the fact that social justice is an ongoing and ever-present call on the lives of Christians. When humans encounter someone who is hungry, we should feed them. When we, when, uh, when we encounter racism, we should do what we can to see that every person is treated with dignity and respect. Where there is injustice of any kind, we should stand up for what is right to whatever extent that is possible and wise to do so. Christ came to redeem humans, but he also came to redeem the whole of creation. As Abraham Kuyper famously put it, and I quote, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. So perhaps we can offer a simple yes to the question and go home. I don't think Dr. Mullen would be real happy with that. <laughs> when we move from, individual, from mandates to individual Christians to the consideration of the role of the church, things are not quite so simple. Even if the individual Christian is called to right the wrongs of social injustice, we must ask, are the obligations of the church and the obligations of the individual Christian the same? Or does the individual Christian have one set of obligations while the Christian church has another? In answering this question, or these questions, we need to ask additional questions surrounding what is meant by the term church. Now, there's, every one of these words in this question could be analyzed. I'm going to focus in on the topic of the church. I'm not debating. I'm just kind of framing this for us, if you will. Um, do we mean the local body by this term? The denomination that houses many local bodies? Ecumenical bodies in which various denominations are included? Or do we mean the invisible church in which all true Christians are included? These clarifying questions ironically complicate the question of the debate even further. Let us say, for the sake of argument, that we come to a clear 
answer regarding the various obligations involved in the various layers of what we mean by the term church. Does this answer or set of answers provide clarity regarding the church's role relative to other institutional bodies? Isn't there a substantive difference between the church in any of its forms and nonprofit organizations such as the Red Cross and the Salvation Army? And between the church and civic organizations such as the Rotary or Optimist Clubs? And the church and governmental bodies such as the U.S. government or the United Nations? How do the obligations of the Christian, of the local church, of denominations, of ecumenical bodies relate to other institutions or civic bodies? Do they relate at all? These considerations are exacerbated by tensions between compassion and personal responsibility that we find in the Bible. On the one hand, James calls Christians to care for the poor. True religion, we are told, consists in care for widows and orphans. Yet Paul warns that, quote, if a man does not work, then neither should he eat. God is portrayed in the Bible as an avenger of the poor and the oppressed. If the poor and oppressed call out to God for justice, God will avenge them. Yet God also instructs the judges of Israel not to favor the rich or the poor simply because they are rich or poor. Rather, the judge should be just, rendering to each what is due regardless of social status. We also find differences between individual mandates in the New Testament and instruction on the church level. Christ tells us that if someone asks for our cloak, we should give him our tunic as well. If someone asks you to go one mile, then you should go with him too. Yet Paul gives Timothy strict instructions regarding how and when to help widows. They must be of a ripe old age, he tells us, otherwise they should remarry. They must be without children or other family. Otherwise, the widow should lean on them instead of the church. And even the widow, if the widow meets these qualifications, she must have been a faithful wife and a faithful Christian in order to receive help from the church. I suppose Paul's remarks here add an additional level of complexity between the individual and the family. And I thought philosophy was complicated. In the current debate, and I guess this is my challenge to our speakers before we get started, we should be careful that we do not fall into either of two fallacies. I am a philosopher. <laughs> the, what I'm going to call the activist fallacy, which says roughly the following. One, something must be done. Two, this is something. Three, therefore, this must be done. <laughs> the question is not this simple. Perhaps there is an, also an inactivist fallacy as well. Number one, addressing unjust situations is complex. Two, the church's role in the world is really quite simple. Three, therefore the church should do nothing regarding complex unjust situations. Again, the question is not that simple. Judging from the turnout tonight, one thing I am sure of is that the topic is relevant to the church today. The stakes are high in this debate, and tonight's guests are here to help us unravel the difficulties behind these questions. Allow me to introduce tonight's uh, debate participants to you. First, we have Jim Wallace. Jim Wallace is the best-selling author, is a best-selling author, a public theologian, and frequent speaker on faith and public life. He's the author of God's Politics, and his latest book is Rediscovering Values on Wall Street Main Street, and your street. He is president and CEO of Sojourners and editor-in-chief of Sojourners magazine, whose combined print and electronic media have readership of more than 250,000 people. His columns appear in major newspapers and blogs, and he regularly appears as a television and radio commentator. He is a husband, father of two young boys, and a Little League baseball coach. Please join me in giving a warm Trinity welcome to Jim Wallace. Our other 
participant, sorry, I keep forgetting to put this up. Our other participant in the debate tonight is Dr. R. Albert Moeller. He serves as president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, the flagship school of the Southern Baptist Convention, and one of the largest seminaries in the world. Dr. Moeller has been recognized by such influential publications as Time and Christianity Today as a leader among American evangelicals. In fact, Time Dot com called him, quote, the reigning intellectual of the evangelical movement in the United States. Dr. Moeller also serves as the Joseph Emerson Brown Professor of Christian Theology at Southern Seminary. He's the author of several books, including Atheism Remix, A Christian Confronts the New Atheists. He is married to Mary, and they have two children, Katie and Christopher. Once again, please join me in giving a warm Trinity welcome to Dr. R. Albert Moeller. Okay, just one more brief word about the format and the rules of the debate. The Trinity debate will be run according to a standard pro-con format. The yes side will begin with a 20-minute opening statement. The no side will follow with a 20-minute statement. Following each of these statements, each side will have 10 minutes for a rebuttal response section. Then after those, there will be two set of five-minute responses each. And then we will turn it over to the Q&A time. Those, I believe there's no cards handy. If you want to uh, ask a question, an anonymous question, please feel free to do that. If you do, make sure you get that to the ushers uh, before that five-minute section starts because we're going to organize them during that, during that time. Uh, using my trusty stopwatch, I'll be notifying each speaker when they have one minute left. I'll be allowing them to finish sentences and thoughts, so I'm not going to be too hardcore about that. But uh, we will try to keep an accountable framework. The whole event should have us out of here at 9 p.m. Well, that's all I have to say in this. I'm going to turn it over to Jim Wallace for the opening 20-minute statement. Thank you. So I used to go here, and so when I hear a professor call my name here, I jump up, I'm ready to go. You know? <laughs> It is great to be back at Trinity, it really is. I have very fond and powerful memories from my time here. All the seminarians who started Sojourners met here. This is really the birthplace of Sojourners. In that little quad over there, they've shut down now, I guess. Uh, no? Some of you live there still? I would send, send a plaque over, birthplace of Sojourners. Uh, it's hard to believe this is our 40th year, but when I was here, I was just 10 years old. <laughs> uh, I know there's a new trinity, which I'm learning as I listen, and I'm glad I'm be glad to hear more about that tonight. Also glad to see Brother Al. We've had some good conversations on your radio show, and uh, we prayed before this, and I think we're both committed to showing that Christians can be uh, civil when they agree or disagree. Uh, and even respectful, even loving is part of the body of Christ. Uh, you don't see that a lot these days as those who rip our social fabric apart with ideological warfare, but we'll do better tonight. Amen? Amen. 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 Um, I will start to address the topic that I was originally invited to do, which is, is social justice an essential part of the gospel? I would say integral to the gospel, and therefore essential to the mission of the church. I say yes. Now, we evangelicals like to share our stories, our testimonies, and mine actually coincides very directly with this question. So I'm going to kind of share my story as it pertains to this question, because it really does. So my parents were Plymouth Brethren leaders, and they started our little evangelical assembly. It was my second home and family. I was getting to be a little older. I was six and hadn't been saved yet. My parents were worried. I'm getting up in years. I'm six. You know? <laughs> so one night we had a preacher come, revival preacher, 
and all the unsaved kids had to sit in the first row. Because <laughs> the closer you are to a sermon, the more impact it'll have on your life, right? So he began to preach, and he was fiery, as advertised. He pointed, it seemed like, right at me. If Jesus came back tonight, your mommy and daddy would be taken to heaven, and you would be left all by yourself. <laughs> it got my attention. <laughs> and I realized that six out of a five-year-old sister to support. <laughs> so I asked my mother how to get out of this, and she, bless her heart, told me not about the wrath of God, but the love of God. God wanted me to be his child. I said, cool, I signed up. <laughs> uh, and that was the beginning, my first conversion. The second, though, was a little different. I was 14 or 15 now. I'm now listening to my city of Detroit. I'm hearing the news. I'm reading the newspapers. I'm paying attention. I'm asking, how come we in white Detroit seem to live quite differently than they live in Black Detroit, just a few miles or blocks away. I heard there were even black Plymouth Brethren churches, though we never visited one or had a preacher. How come you're too young to, 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 to ask those questions? When you get older, you'll understand it. The only honest answer was, if you keep asking that question, you're going to get into trouble. That proved to be true. <laughs> so I went into the city as a young 14-year-old kid and began to wander around and listen. Got taken in by the black churches. Came home with new questions, new friends, and new answers. And one night that I will never forget, an elder said to me, Jim, you have to understand, Christianity has nothing to do with racism. That's political. And our faith is personal. I was 15, but in my head and in my heart, I know I left that night. I was gone in a couple years, and I didn't have words to go around that experience back then, but I do now, and these are these words. God is personal, but never private. This God wants a relationship with, this God knows everything about every one of us in this room, and wants a relationship anyway. Why? Because God wants to draw us to himself and then sign us up for God's purposes in the world. Personal, but never private. I got kicked out of a little church, left happily, and joined the student movements, the civil rights movement, the anti-war movements of my, my generation. We could put... 10,000 people in the street, about two hours' time in Michigan State. We put a half million people in Washington, D.C., but it wasn't enough. It didn't answer my deeper questions, and I went back to the New Testament. And though I'd been kicked out of the church, I realized I'd never quite been shed of Jesus, that he kind of hung out with me all along. I went to the book of Matthew. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, a light is dawn. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then I read Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. And I wonder why in my evangelical upbringing had I never heard a sermon on the Sermon on the Mount. Here is... The charter of God's new order, the Magna Carta of the kingdom. This is the personality of the kingdom. It reverses all the world's values. And I was taken by that. And I then began to understand Jesus is saying, a new order is about to break in. Repent. Metanoia. It means turn around, go in a new direction. If you want to participate in that new order, you've got to be spiritually remade. So much so that John would later call it a new birth, equipped to participate in a new order that has come into the world to change everything personally, spiritually, economically, socially, racially, politically, and change us with it. 
Never heard that before. I kept reading. I got to Matthew chapter 25, which was my conversion text. Here is Jesus, son of God, sitting in judgment. It is a judgment passage, saying, I was hungry. I was thirsty. I was naked. I was sick. I was in prison, and you weren't there for me. Lord, when did we see you hungry, thirsty, sick, naked? If we'd known it was you, Lord, we would have done something, at least from the social action committee. (laughs) As you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. Here is the Son of God saying, I will know how much you love me by how you treat them. Those who are left out, left behind, those who are most forgotten. That was more radical, I thought, than Karl Marx, Che Guevara, or Ho Chi Minh. Here was a transformation of things that I had never heard before. Matthew 25 brought me to Christ and then to Trinity. Now, I have a Southern Baptist friend who tells me God called me to the seminary and hadn't spoken to me since. <laughs> not, not his seminary, though. <laughs> and not here. Because I met this group of students, and we were from all over the place. Student movements, and Bob Jones University, and Campus Crusade, and University. We would meet in that little quad every night. Bible study, prayer, wrestling, figuring out what the gospel meant. One of the first things we did, we took an old Bible... And, and we, we found every text in the Bible about the poor. Every single text. We found 2,000 verses about the poor, the oppressed, God's love for those who are left, on, left behind, wealth and poverty. So one of my Trinity classmates took an old Bible and a pair of scissors and began to cut out every single reference to the poor. Prophets were decimated. Uh, Mary's wonderful song, her Magnificat, gone. A certain amount, Jesus, Jesus, uh, his, his teachings were on. on the cutting room floor. I would take the Bible out to preach. We were a little controversial in those days, as you might have heard. And I would say, brothers and sisters, this is the American Bible, full of holes, falling apart in my hands. It was just in shreds. All we've taken out. We've come a long way. In fact, now, there's a new Bible called the Poverty and Justice Bible. The Bible Society and World Vision put this out, referencing that old story of Trinity. And now they've taken all that stuff off the cutting room floor, put it back in the Bible in World Vision orange. (laughs) So you can't miss it. And a whole new generation of you are putting our Bibles back together again. One of those scriptures was, of course, Luke 4, what I call Jesus' Nazareth Manifesto. His first gig, his first words, his mission statement. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news, the evangel, where we get the word evangelical, to the poor. What that says to me is whatever else the gospel is, whatever else it does, whatever it, whatever it does in our lives, If it isn't good news to the poor, it isn't the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I put that out for our conversation tonight. So I'm a revival preacher. I love John Wesley. I got to preach his pulpit in central London once. I love how Wilberforce got converted by the Wesley revival and then became the parliamentarian who spent 30 years to end slavery in the UK. I love those stories. I love Charles Finney, who pioneered the altar call. He'd call people to Christ and at the same time, same night, sign them up for the anti-slavery campaign, often on the spot. Too many liberals have a social cause but have dropped the altar call. No more conversion. Too many conservatives have, have, have an altar call but no more mission to the world. We must move away from an either-or gospel. It's time for both and biblical thinking. 
And that's what I want to say tonight. We need biblical, orthodox, evangelical faith. A real cross, a real resurrection, a real kingdom, and a real mission for the church. I'll tell you a quick story. Got some time still? All right. Great, I'm good. So I'm having a conversation one day with Marcus Borg and Dominic Crossan. And um, I knew it's, we're, at a, we're at a conference, we're speaking. I knew at some point theology might come up. <laughs> so I did over lunch one day. And they said, now Jim, we love the social justice stuff. We're, we're right with you. You got you got the crowd all excited, and we're there too. But you have quite you have kind of a literal view of the resurrection, don't you? I said, yes, I do. Ours is more well, it's more metaphorical. Now I know N.T. Wright, and they have been having this conversation, so I don't want to repeat all that. Here's what came to me in that moment: Do you think in the heart of apartheid, in the heat of injustice? A merely metaphorical view of the resurrection would have been enough for Desmond Tutu. Because it wouldn't have been enough for me. You see, this is how all this connects. Desmond Tutu is one of my elders. He taught me my theology of hope. I've been interrogated by, this, by the <laughs> South African security police. You had to have an orthodox view of the resurrection to get through that battle. You had to have. And so I talk about personal faith and social justice. I was on Morning Joe uh, uh, a couple weeks back, and Joe Scarborough was talking about a new generation of math 25 Christians across the spectrum, across the boundaries, who are talking about the ministry of Christ again. I'm in Park Street, Boston, and I was, it was told to me that Charles Finney preached there in the 1820s. And here I am, same pulpit. And, and during the week, he was doing revivals, and people were coming to Christ and joining the abolitionist cause. That night, the room was full of all 20-somethings who called themselves new abolitionists, trying to end human trafficking where there are more women and children now in slavery than when Wilberforce freed them 200 years ago. And for them, it was a matter of faith. I was at CCDA, John Perkins, a wonderful Christian Community Development Association meeting last week. 3,000 evangelicals, all colors of the rainbow, talking about incarnational theology. You know what's different about our faith, Christian faith? And all the others, it's the incarnation when in Jesus Christ, God hits the streets, hits the streets. I teach Georgetown, and I do theology and public life. I said, we have to have a street test for our theology if we're people of faith. If it doesn't mean anything on the streets, what does it mean to be an incarnational Christian? The National Association of Evangelicals, the NAE now, read their statement, The Health of the Nations. It talks about creation care, about poverty, about immigration reform, about peacemaking. At Cedar University last week, a Baptist school in Ohio, nobody would confuse for a liberal school. <laughs> 3,000 students in, from 20 Christian college campuses were there talk about what does it mean to protect the stranger, undocumented people. How do we find a balanced policy of immigration reform going forward? Richard Land, your colleague, and I spoke on the same side of the issue. The system is broken. We as Christians can help to change a broken system. I see, I see a new generation who wants their faith and their lives to make a difference in the world. It's always personal. It's always public. It's new life. It's a new order. It's a new community of faith. 
You know what we are called at first, the Christians, way back when? We are called the people of the way. The way of Christ, the Sermon on the Mount, which was a catechism for all the early converts. People of the way. Not people of the experience or people of the right doctrine or even people of the church. We were the people of the way and then the people of the way because Christ gathered right from the start a community of people to live this and show it. To not just tell others what to do, but first to do it ourselves and then to live and then lead by example. One minute. My Plymouth Brethren tradition and Al's Southern Baptist tradition, when it came to the most one of the most important moral issues of our time, the issue of race in America and a civil rights movement led by black churches, my tradition and his failed. We were wrong. We thought we understood the gospel. We thought we got the atonement right. We were wrong about race in America. We missed the civil rights movement. Carl Ruby at Cedarville, vice president last week, in front of all his students, said, we missed the civil rights movement. Let's not miss this one, too. Let's not miss this one, too. I, our audiences now are half under 30 all the time on the road. I was up at uh, Occupy Wall Street last week. I'll tell you about that if you want. Even Occupy Grand Rapids. <laughs> <laughs> but I think your generation is going to help put those holy Bibles back there and make them truly holy Bibles again. I've got a lot of investment in you, a new generation. So I'm glad tonight to talk about this because finally it is the gospel of the kingdom the Bible calls us to. And the gospel of the kingdom has the power to evangelize a new generation. And about that, I am very, very hopeful. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Jim, and greetings to you all. I greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is good to be here. It's good to be a part of a conversation that is civil and uh, also important, and a conversation that clearly has uh, not only the capacity to draw a crowd, but uh, hopefully to draw our best thinking as well. I want to express appreciation to Trinity Evangelical Divinity School for hosting such a substantial conversation, uh, and to all those of, of you who came, and uh, those, as they say, here in the room, or those watching us by television, and uh, keep those cards and letters coming. We appreciate all those who are... <laughs> out there uh, watching on the World Wide Web. It is good to be in conversation again with my friend Jim Wallace. Uh, one thing we have proved is that there is no end of things to talk about. <laughs> and that's good. Uh, but the last thing we did before coming in here together was to pray together that, uh, that what we do would glorify God and strengthen His church. And we ought not to be afraid of this kind of conversation. This is the kind of conversation that should encourage the saints. We, we are up to this. We, uh, we, we need to do this. And there are important issues at stake, and there is certainly a great deal of importance invested in the particular question that is asked and framed for this debate. Is social justice an essential part of the mission of the church? That's a dangerous question to answer. It, it's dangerous to answer in either way without a very careful delineation and definition of terms. Every one of these terms is a matter that requires very specific, careful, and mature definition. First of all, social justice. I'm not sure there is such a category. Let's just call it justice. Let's just be very clear about the fact that justice is a very clear biblical category, but it, that is because, first and foremost, it is one of the attributes of the one true and living God. It is one of the attributes of the God who alone is just and who hates injustice. 
And injustice is injustice, not because it violates our moral sensibilities, but first and foremost, because it robs God of his glory as the only just one whose creation is in every respect to reflect his attributes, including his justice. So one of the things we have to admit is that we are, in our own human frame of reference, not very good at detecting that which is just or that which is unjust. We require divine revelation in order to understand this. We're thankful that God has indeed revealed himself in the very order of creation around us, such that those who do not even know him have a soul that cries out for justice and is appalled by injustice. In a Genesis 3 fallen world, we have to acknowledge that we are desperately in need of the divine revelation, special revelation, scriptural revelation, Christological revelation, to know what justice really is and what injustice really is, so that we will love the first and hate the second. We are to have justice as one of our concerns as Christians, a very high concern, because it is one of God's own very high concerns, because it is a matter of his own character. So when I speak of justice, I'm not sure that social justice is a very helpful category, because we don't have private justice and social justice, we have justice as a divine category, and yes, it does have clear social ramifications and application. Essential. Is social justice an essential part of the mission of the church? Essential is one of those words we like to use. It's kind of like the word literal. Most people use it, literally use it the wrong way. <laughs> but, uh, speaking of essential, it, it means, is it the essence of the thing? And uh, is it the essence of the mission of the, of the church to do and to advocate for social justice. Well, first of all, if we're speaking of essence, once again, justice essentially belongs to God. And to thus justice, well, rather, essentially, must be one of the concerns of God's people. The people who are purchased with the blood of his own son and who have been justified, made just, solely by the atonement that was purchased by his son in accordance with his own justice. The God we serve, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the, the God who, whose purpose was to save sinners through the blood of his own Son, is the God whom Paul says in the atonement displays himself to be both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ Jesus. So it's the essence of God's people, of the redeemed, to understand that justice is one of our concerns primarily because we justly deserve the absolute and eternal condemnation of God. But God has justly saved us by demonstrating himself to be both merciful and righteous, by requiring the sacrifice as the full penalty for sin for his unjust people, his enemies we are, and then by supplying that one sacrifice that alone would purchase our salvation. He is then the just and justifying God. So this is an essential concern for Christ's justified people. How can Christ's justified people be unconcerned about justice? So is it essential to Christ's people? Yes. To the mission of the church? Well, that requires attendance to the word mission. It's one of those indispensable words. We, we can't talk about much of what we talk about in terms of church life without talking about mission. It's not a word that's found in Scripture itself. But if it means anything, it means that there is a purpose that is to be accomplished. And in this case, it's not a purpose that the church has simply voted to take upon itself. It is that which is assigned. The mission has to do with the fact that the church is sent. And that sending comes with very, very clear assignments. What is the mission of the church? Well, to that we will give some very important attention. But everything the church does is not its mission. There are many things that the church is involved with that are not essentially its mission, but are nonetheless what Christ's people do precisely because they belong to Christ. The church. Here again, if we are speaking in one sense, and, and this is the danger of this question in the larger public sense, because the larger public simply assumes when we say church, we mean Christians. And when we say Christians, we mean church. But we have to have a kind of mature evangelical biblical conversation here that reminds ourselves that we have to speak of the church in terms of its New Testament usage as the gathered body of believers, the assembly of the saints. And so there's a sense in which any of us answering the question in public would be tempted to speak of all Christians simply as the church. 
But the moment we begin speaking to ourselves about New Testament theology and the clear teachings that, that are revealed in the New Testament about the church, we begin speaking institutionally, congregationally, by extension perhaps you might say even denominationally, but my concern is the concern in the New Testament to identify the church as the assembly of, of the redeemed. I do believe there is a church beyond the visible church. I believe as uh, the confessions say, that the church is made up of all the redeemed throughout all the ages, uh, those of, of, of all races and people, such that we look forward to the revelation of that true church when before the throne of God there are men and women from every tongue and tribe and people and nation. But right now we are in assemblies where the question is, what do we do once we are gathered together as the assembly of the redeemed? What is our charge? What has God sent us to do? Well, are we to do good works? Certainly Christians are to do good works. And as a matter of fact, this is essential to our witness for the gospel. For instance, in the Sermon on the Mount, which I preached on this last Sunday and will preach on again in the next Lord's Day, we are instructed, let your light so shine before others so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. That's Jesus. Peter, interestingly enough, giving advice to the early church, says this in, second, in 1 Peter 2.15, for this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. In other words, if you're accused of doing something, let it be an accusation of doing something good. Christ's redeemed people are to be involved and engaged throughout the society, doing good, living justly, doing justice, contributing to every good work in every dimension of the society, in politics, in the arts, in commerce, in education, in economics, and in any other conceivable category of human endeavor. Here we are guided by the conversation that the church has had throughout the centuries. In particular, I find my best understanding of this in Augustine, that great bishop of North Africa, who reminds us that there are two cities, the city of God and the city of man. One is an eternal city and one is a passing city. Each has its own love. The animating love of the city of God is the love of God. The animating love of the city of man is love of man. But God has created the city of man for his glory and he loves the city of man. The city of man is made up of those who are his enemies, but is also made up of those amongst his enemies who have come to faith and knowledge in the Lord Jesus Christ and have become thereby citizens of the, of the city of God. They are still, in this life, citizens of the city of man, and they have responsibilities in the city of man. Just as in the great commandment, as Jesus repeated it, he makes very clear that the first commandment is, is love of God, but the second commandment is love of neighbor. That neighbor is non-exclusive and is absolutely global. We thereby understand that we have concern for and work to do in the city of man precisely because of love of God. Love of neighbor does not stand on its own for the Christian. It is derivative of the love of God. Because we, as God's redeemed people, must love what God loves. And that means we must love whom God loves. The church. Well, here again, we're speaking of the church as the gathered body of believers. Uh, the church in terms of its gathered life where it has a mission that is invested in it. And the mission of the church is the message of the kingdom. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The verbs that are found in the New Testament assigned to the church are verbs such as, in their parsipial form, preaching, telling, teaching, going, sending, admonishing, warning, witnessing, and of course making disciples. The mission of the church is the body of Christ, the assembly of the redeemed, is to herald the good tidings of the gospel so that sinners come to hear and hearing come to know and knowing come to believe what the gospel tells us about the Lord Jesus Christ and the salvation that is found in him alone and believing, be saved. In other words, our first priority within the city of man is to preach the gospel promiscuously so that others of God's enemies may be forgiven, may repent of their sins, having trusted in Jesus Christ and become citizens of the city of God. Now, basic to my understanding of these things is that we find the mission of the church in the New Testament. And the New Testament is to be our authority. And when the New Testament speaks of what is invested in the church, both in terms of the direct teachings of the New Testament, that is by what is present, and also by the actual narratives telling us what the church did, both by the presence of certain things and the absence of certain things, we come to understand the New Testament's understanding of the mission of the church. Now, when we talk about the mission of Christians, 
I want to suggest that that is different. The ministry of the church is inherently charismatic. It is the message of the kingdom. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is organizing and deploying its energies and its members in such a way that its one most supreme concern is to glorify God through the preaching and teaching of the gospel so that God's enemies become joint heirs with Christ. They come to know that salvation that comes through Christ alone and come to know that citizenship that is first of all in heaven, even as in this earthly life they remain citizens of this world. Now what are Christians to do? Speaking as Christ-redeemed people, Christians. Christians are to be agents of justice, mercy, righteousness in the society. In essence, repairing what is torn. Now, if we are indeed about the business in everything that we do of repairing that which is torn, then we are also about the business of restoring God's glory in a fallen world. In other words, we need a larger theological frame than merely saying this is a good thing to do. We even need a larger theological frame than saying this is something that is just. The larger theological frame is that God is glorified when his fallen creation is to any degree rectified. That is drawn into a a closer alignment with his own justice, his own righteousness, his own attributes. He loves this, and that is what the people who love him should be about. That means that we should celebrate every good thing that is done in Christ's name. Every just law that is executed, every orphan that is adopted, every child that is clothed, every racial barrier that is torn down, every hungry person that is fed, every hospital that is built, every well that is dug, uh, every disease that is eliminated, every school that is built, and every captive rightly freed. This reveals and partly restores the glory of God in a fallen and catastrophically sinful world, a world in which God's glory is robbed of him by every despot, by every injustice, by every abandoned child, every thirsty human being who is made in God's very image. We are to be about the task of repairing, revealing, and restoring God's glory. And we understand that oftentimes in this work, the stakes are nothing less than life and death. In this work within the city of man, the stakes involved in these ministries Ministries of adoption, of healing, ministries of, 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 of medicine, ministries of, of reconciliation, ministries of liberation. All of these things can be and often are literally quite certainly matters of life and death. Even when they are not matters of life and death, they are matters that can make the difference between human misery and human flourishing. Christ's people must be agents of human flourishing precisely because flourishing was God's intention for his human creatures in creation. And sin is indeed not only that which robs God of his glory and violates God's law and statue, it is by definition also that because God loves us and has revealed to us the way we are to live, sin is also that which creates all those things that are inimical and opposed to human flourishing. Now the logic in the New Testament here is very clear. Paul cries out, "'Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel.'" The priority the church has made clear in terms of the church's message as the church. When, for instance, Paul writes to the Corinthians and says, I delivered unto you which was that which was of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that God raised him from the dead according to the scriptures. Romans chapter 10 reveals the urgent logic of the gospel, the logic of the charismatic mission of the church. We are told that all those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And then, of course, the Apostle Paul asked the question, how will they hear? And then using incredibly beautiful, revealed, inspired logic, the Apostle Paul makes very clear that if we do not sin, they will not go. If they do not go, those who desperately need to hear the gospel will not hear. And if they do not hear, they will not be saved. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Christians must be concerned with human suffering in any form and be agents of alleviating and, where possible, ending that suffering. But the Bible clearly presents the greatest human suffering as the suffering of the unrepentant sinner for eternity. The greatest, most urgent, and only truly essential mission of the church as the church, as charged in the New Testament, is the message of the gospel. This is genuinely what is hope to the hopeless. In Romans chapter 8, verse 18, we read, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. This is true for all of us. 
It will never be possible for the church, as the church, to eliminate human suffering. It is, however, the glad opportunity of the church to declare the gospel, which leads to eternal life. Christians, in the midst of this life, living as obedient disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, because after all, the church is to be about the task. There's no question that the church is assigned, is assigned the task of making disciples. Those disciples deployed in the world should be about all these good things and necessary things. And we should be shamed where Christ's people do not do these things. Christ's redeemed people can therefore never be complacent about human suffering, but we must be concerned about the eternal suffering preeminently of the sinner who above all desperately needs to hear the good news of the gospel. This means we cannot trust our eyes. We can't trust the eyes about when our task begins nor about when our task as Christians ends. Christ's purpose, as becomes very clear in the New Testament is indeed to set his people loose in the world of agents of every good thing for the Father's glory and also for the opportunity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The church must be ever committed to its commission. The Great Commission, of course, it's it's no accident that we look to those verses in Matthew and call them the Great Commission, not because they are found nowhere else in the Bible, but rather because they are distilled in that one very clear order from the Lord Jesus Christ to his church. And it's often misconstrued by evangelicals, just as evangelism. It isn't just evangelism, as if you can even use the expression just evangelism. It is about making disciples. And the task of making disciples means filling them with the message of the kingdom in order to deploy them in the world to do everything that will bring God's glory. Now, what is present in the New Testament are clear imperatives. The shape of the commission given to the church, which is made up of action words, and those action words addressed to the church are charismatic, about preaching and teaching and proclaiming and taking and sending and going. Folks, I'm not concerned that any good thing that might be done in Christ's name ought not to be done. Well, you hear me clearly. Much more than these must be done. These things must be done and not left undone. But my concern, and I think the concern of the New Testament, is what the church must do that only the church can do, and that is to herald the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and across all barriers to all peoples and all races of all tribes and all nations to declare salvation in Jesus Christ our Lord. Thus, the ministry of the church is first and foremost charismatic. What is present in the New Testament is that charge. What is absent in the New Testament is any record of the church taking on itself institutionally a massive program for social action. It's just completely absent from the New Testament. The going is there, the proclaiming is there, the defending is there, the admonishing is there, and Christ's people are deployed everywhere doing these things as Christ has taught us in the Sermon on the Mount and elsewhere in Scripture, repairing, reconciling, renewing, and restoring the glory of God in a fallen creation. But ultimately, only God will do that on that day in which all things will be made well. In the meantime, we had better be found doing those things Christ would have his people to do and his church doing what only the church can do. And we must do all these things to the glory of God. We are, after all, a purchased people. We are to be about the task that he who purchased us would send us to do. If you, uh, if you have questions, you have about 20 more minutes to write them down on those cards. We will also have someone with microphones in the Q&A time. I forgot to remind the people online that if they want to tweet a question, they should include the tag at Carl Henry Center. Again, the tag is at Carl Henry Center, and I will be uh, looking at those as one word. Now we're on to the 10-minute uh, response rebuttal time, and I'll turn it over to Jim Wallach. Well, let's change the language from rebuttal to dialogue. How's that? Okay. I don't want to rebut anybody. Um, <laughs> let's, go, let's, let's go back to my story. Um, when I got saved at six, you know, of course, my church, my, my wife was the first woman ordained Church of England 15 years ago, and, you know, she believes in uh, all that, um, 
the child baptism. We believed in adult baptism, so I was baptized at eight in my church. Um, <laughs> um, uh, but I always remember, it was always my faith was about, they would say, you and the Lord. You and the Lord, me and the Lord. The world never came into the conversation except that I wasn't supposed to be worldly. That came in a lot. Uh, and it was tough because in my church, dancing was the problem, and it was, it was Motown, man, Detroit. You know, I, I just had a hard time with that. But, uh, uh, but I want to go to the Great Commission because Al brought us there. Because that's central to this. Uh, go into the world making disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe whatever I have commanded you. Teaching them to observe whatever I have commanded you. They're, they're so, the teaching of Jesus matters here. The Lausanne Covenant, a whole evangelical movement, pilgrimage, has made it clear that the proclamation of the gospel includes how justice is integral to the gospel. Integral to the gospel. So in my little church, where did my little church, uh, good folks, good, where did they go wrong? They understood. My father got up at 5 o'clock every morning before going to work at 7 to read his Bible. He was a lay, a lay pastor, Plymouth Brethren, had no clergy. Every morning. He had a library full of account. He understood substitutionary atonement. He did. But my church made the mistake of what I would call, in shorthand, an atonement-only gospel. In the language of J.B. Phillips, their God was too small. It was too narrow to bifurcate it. It was purely a private faith, a gospel message that doesn't even try to change the world, only works for those who don't need the world changed. Therefore, it's dangerous in affluent countries. It can become too white, too privileged, too American, to male, and I have to say that when I got welcomed into that black church as a teenage kid, my experience was and is that the most holistic church in this nation's history is the black church. Personal salvation, absolutely, and social justice, integral to the gospel. And I identify myself with that body of Christ I was at a conference recently and people were just stunned that I said, I have more in common with the global body of Christ than I do with my fellow American citizens. Because I think we are Christians first. The global body of Christ all over the world, the evangelical movement is talking about the integral gospel. The integral gospel. Correct intellectual belief was a major concern of the Greeks. The early Christians, in contrast, were concerned with transformation. And indeed, it created this community that was a caring, sharing, loving community. The poor and the oppressed were especially welcomed. There was a sensitivity to them. Old barriers, racial barriers brought down. In Christ, there is no bond or free, Jew or Gentile, male or female, the principal divisions of the world were being overcome. As Sam Rodriguez, the Hispanic evangelist, says, it's a cross. It is vertical and horizontal. We are reconciled to Christ, then reconciled to each other and the whole creation. I met John Stott at Trinity. He was teaching one semester, and one long night, he met with our group. We were called the Radicals in those days. <laughs> and he met with the Radicals, and he helped us to understand the gospel of the kingdom is a message of transformation in our personal lives, our spiritual lives, our social lives, our economic lives, even our political lives. And so the early church was... A, a, a marked 
distinct community. It was different than anyone. When Peter said, always be ready to give reason for the faith and hope that's within you, he was making an assumption that people are asking questions of us. Why do you live this way? Why do you lose? You don't live the way we do. You don't act like we act. You have a different set of values. They're upside down for us. Why do you live that way? And when they ask, he said, be ready to tell them why. All right? Our problem in this country is people often aren't asking us why we live the way we do because we live the way that so many other people do of our class, our culture, our race, our nation, our neighborhood. And our evangelism becomes trying to answer a question nobody's asking. And that's very difficult. The early church, they were breaking down barriers. They wouldn't kill. They, they shared all. They, they treated each other as if they were brothers and sisters because of what happened to them as they were reconciled. So the church is really all people get to see of what we mean by the gospel. Adam Hamilton, who's the pastor of the biggest Methodist church in America, 10,000 folks, and he's an evangelical in uh, Kansas City. He starts with mission. They involve even folks who are non-Christians in the mission, doing all the good stuff that people in in Kansas City ought to be doing. Anyone who cares about that sees the church doing this great stuff and they want to be, they join. But because he's not a liberal Methodist, he's an evangelical, he cares about evangelism and they always get to that. Why do you do what you do? And then, that's when they tell him about Jesus. In my neighborhood, there was a woman named Mary Glover in D.C., and, and uh, we had a little food line 20 blocks from the White House, just a little bag of groceries for hundreds of people who would come every Saturday morning, 20 blocks from the White House. And it was always worth going just to hear Mary Glover pray, because she prayed like she knew whom, who she was talking to. <laughs> she was an old Pentecostal lady who, who she had a conversation going with her Lord for a long time. Thank you, Lord, for waking me up today, she said. Thank you, the walls of my grave, walls of my room were not the walls of my grave. My bed was not my cooling board. Thank you, Lord. And they'd be waiting outside to come in, and we'd be holding hands, and she says, No, Lord, we know you'll be coming through this line today. We know you'll be coming through this line today. So, Lord, help us to treat you well. Help us to treat you well. Best commentary in Matthew 25 I've ever read. And she was a missionary in the neighborhood. She, she'd tell me her strategy. First, when I see these people, I just, I just smiles at them. Don't want to scare them away. <laughs> Next time, I say, how you doing? See what they say back. I keep going until I'm talking to them about Jesus. But she believed that in those folks coming through that food line, she was, we were welcoming Christ himself. And she said, help us, Lord. To treat you well. That kind of community is evangelistic in a neighborhood, in a nation, in the world. It makes people ask, why do you do the things that you do? Then we give reason for the faith and the hope that's in us. It is good to have the dialogue, whether we call it uh, dialogue or rebuttal or anything else. Uh, we're not here to, uh, to debate formally, uh, but we are to have a discussion that, that gets to the issues. And so I'm going to try to respond somewhat to some of the things Jim had to say. Uh, I think, first of all, when you have an issue like this, I want to go back to some of the things that I tried to say earlier and apply them here. Um, like I say, I, I think looking at a question like this one is no. Let, let, let me just tell you, I was not anxious to take no. <laughs> okay, uh, I, I've been debating for a long time. Yes is the stronger hand, and I, I, like, I like yes. 
Uh, but nonetheless, I agreed to do this out of respect for Trinity, out of respect, frankly, for Jim, out of respect for you, because I, I believe we ought to be having this discussion. So at least some of what's going on here is a discussion about two different questions. And, uh, and that's probably instructive in and of itself. Uh, I think some of the way that people think the question is framed is that you'll have folks on one side who believe the church ought to be doing all kinds of good works, and on the other side, you have uh, folks who believe that those good works ought not to be done. Well, let's be clear. The New Testament as a whole, much less the, the totality of the scriptural revelation, makes clear we are to be about those good works. We will be judged in terms of our faithfulness to all that, that God has commanded us. We are indeed, as we said in the Great Commission, to, to teach disciples to obey all that Christ has commanded. So the conversation ought not to be about what ought not to be done but rather about what must be done. And, and there, I just have to tell you, I have nowhere to turn but to the New Testament. And there are a lot of other places I might be tempted to turn, but in terms of the assignment to the church, I just think we have to be really, really careful to make a decision as to whether that's what's going to fundamentally guide us or not. Because, well, let me go back to something Jim said here. Almost everything Jim said, which thrills me to hear so much of it, is actually about the church. And, and nothing he said about the church is, is lacking in, in gospel content in terms of what Christ's people are to, are to look like. The church is to be made up of those who break down all those barriers within the church. That doesn't quite get to the issue of social justice. The, the first thing we have here is a picture of God's redeemed people. And, and that's a separate question from the question of social justice. In the New Testament, you have beautiful, poetic, thrilling, and for that matter, convicting pictures of what the church is to look like. And to our shame, when our churches don't look like that, uh, it demonstrates an inadequate love of Christ. And Jim was right, speaking of his own denominational background and frankly speaking of mine. We can look through the annals of church history and see where the church fell and falls so woefully short of the glory of God. And thus, like I say, that picture should convict us. And then we have to come back and say, what is it that the church is supposed to do? Here again, just looking through the New Testament. I mean, just look at the New Testament, what the church is first and foremost to do. Look at the preaching of the New Testament. The preaching of the New Testament is the preaching of the kingdom. It is first and foremost the preaching about how sinners can be made right with God. The apostolic preaching in the book of Acts, did it have social implications? Of course it did, but the preaching itself is, is the preaching of the gospel. What, what Paul talks about, the, what, what Paul does, what Paul writes. Now, now clearly, there, there had to be an impact in Rome because Christians were there. Uh, there had to be an impact in Thessalonica because Christians were there. there. There better be a difference in Chicago because Christians are there. And I think the most important thing we need to recognize is that Christ's people are to be deployed in every area. One of the problems with the question about the church and social justice is also just frankly the fact that we're not particularly good at this. And it wouldn't serve the cause of Christ for us to establish, for instance, a hospital in which we claim a Christian identity so that everyone, from those who wax the floor to those who do the surgery, have to be regenerate believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. I've been operated on by outright pagans, I'm quite sure. <laughs> and, and probably I'm here today simply because of that. But the, the fact is, is that God's people, Christ's people, Christ's redeemed people are to be distributed throughout the in the entire society, in the entire world, doing good. We need Christian doctors and Christian artists and, 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 and Christian everything you can imagine that, that would be doing good. We need Christians who are activists in the community and Christians who are involved in government and the making of just laws. We need Christian judges. We need Christian police officers. We need Christians and every new Christians teaching in the schools. We need Christians who are binding up the weak. We need, we need Christians who are just everywhere you can imagine. But as we read the New Testament, what the church as the church together is assigned to do is first and foremost to preach the gospel and to make disciples and then to set those disciples loose. I think the other thing that we always have to keep in mind is where we fall in the grand narrative of Scripture. And we have to have that totality. We're talking about a Scripture that reveals a consistent narrative of creation and fall and redemption and consummation. We're in that period of already and not yet. We, we are in the period between the decisive act of God in Christ and that decisive act of shalom and of kingdom in which we have the full revealing of the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. On that day, every eye will be dry and every tear will be wiped away. But, you know, that's talking about the church. 
I mean, we need to recognize that insofar as we do these good works in the city of man, they will last so long as the city of man lasts. But God loves the city of man, and we are given this. We have an incarnational anthropology. We have been put as God's creatures on this earth, the only creature made in his image, to do that which we know brings him glory, and which not doing we know robs him of that glory. But the church's primary mission is that which cannot be seen so evidently, and that is the mission of seeing persons, as we read in Colossians, transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. That's the church's main responsibility. There's a lot to do on the way there. There are many good things that need to be done. There are many eyes in this life that need to be wiped of tears. And there is much suffering that we can and must alleviate. There are many barriers we can and must break down. There are many injustices we can and must make right and thus make just. But at the end of the day, we will never be able to alleviate every suffering. That doesn't excuse us for failing to alleviate any that is before us. It doesn't mean that we are able ever to achieve absolute human justice. Absolute, absolute justice, God only can do. We, we, we can take someone who, who has imbibed alcohol and gone out driving on the highway and, and causes an accident. We can have a 14-year-old girl who is thus paralyzed. We can put him in jail and we justly must execute justice. But God's justice is restorative justice. She will walk again. And so far as she comes to know salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ and be made well. Even in this life, though, she, as a regenerate believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, will still limp and may not walk. And she will need our care and remind us of all the rest who need care. But she should also remind us that ultimately we are looking for that restoration which only God can bring. The repair which in Christ only he can accomplish. You know, I'm afraid that a lot of these discussions we end up with meta-issues, well, we need to recognize something very interesting. I think virtually all of us in this room, and I'm, I would put myself with Jim in this category. J Jim and I surely would differ. We've talked about this many times, and we could have a different debate on this topic. We might differ about what kind of policies and, and laws and systems might lead to the greatest human flourishing. We're both obligated to hope for, pray for, and work for the greatest human flourishing. But when there is a need before us, both of us would probably have pretty much the same knowledge of what it is we are to do. Most of the debate and the debate over these issues in the Christian church is a bit too hypothetical. When the need's right before our eyes, we generally know what to do. And the question is whether or not we're going to do it. Again, our concern must not be with what is done that anything done would be undone. Our concern is to see even more things done. The concern is what will be left undone if the church does not do what only the church can do. And that is herald the message of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. So I get a call one day, and uh, actually it was a letter, the first time it was a letter, and it says, we hear that when people have read your books, that sometimes you'll come and talk to them about your books and have a discussion. So we'd like you to come and talk to us. It's signed by a young prisoner from Sing Sing Prison in upstate New York. It sounded interesting. I wrote back and said, sure. When do you want me to come? He says, well, we're free most nights. <laughs> We're kind of a captive audience here, he said, this young brother. And I went up there, and the warden was very kind, gave me a room in the bowels of that infamous prison. But 80 guys left us alone for about four hours. One of them said, you know, Jim, all of us here at Sing Sing, the whole prison, we're from about four or five neighborhoods in New York City. Four or five neighborhoods. It's like a train, he said. It begins in my neighborhood. You get on when you're nine or ten years old, and the train ends up here at Sing Sing. The New York Theological Seminary is running a program inside the walls of Sing Sing. You get your Masters of Divinity inside the walls. This kid said, you know, 
I was on that train, but I've had a conversion, a spiritual conversion. When I get out, I'm going to go back and stop that train. Two years later, I'm in New York leading a town meeting in poverty. Guess who's up front? Now back home, trying to stop that train. Because he had a conversion. And he believes what he was doing now to stop that train was essential to the mission and ministry of the church. We agree. It's preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Of the kingdom. And in the text, it goes from Matthew 4, where it says that, to 5, 6, and 7. The Sermon on the Mount, the charter of the new order. This is what it's supposed to be. The declaration of a new order. It's about very concrete things. Money, possessions, power, violence, anxiety, sexuality, faith, and the law, security, true and false religion. We treat our neighbor the way we treat our enemies. Not just religious issues, but the stuff of life, how we live. And they were meant to be a manifestation of the kingdom. That's how we are supposed to live. Now, what that community can do in various times depends on its context. And so when Charles and John Wesley were preaching and people getting saved and coming to the Lord, and one was a young parliamentarian named Wilberforce, they didn't say that, you know, um, it would be okay if English Christians just didn't themselves have slaves. No, they said, we've got to end the slave trade. End the slave trade. To do that meant they had to do things that you could do in more democratic England then than you could in the early church. You, you had to fight for a change in structure and policy and systems. Noel Castellanos from Chicago, CCDA, told me last week, when you live and work among the poor, you always end up running up against injustice. Poverty is an accident. It's systems and structures and all of that, habits and hardness of the heart. Martin King didn't say, it's okay if we Christians just don't discriminate. He said, we've got to end Jim Crow, a system in the South. That takes movements and change in politics. That is what... The black church made that movement possible. Were it not for the black churches who thought this was part of their mission, there wouldn't have been a civil rights movement at all. So we get some help from the prophets here. You know, they look at the prophets. They, who are they talking to? Talking to rulers and princes and kings and landlords and employers and judges. That's what they're talking to. What are they talking about? Widows, orphans, debtors, workers, poor and the oppressed, those who are victims of bad ju judicial decisions. What are the topics? Land, labor, capital, all of that, the stuff of life. People expect those who have been transformed by Jesus Christ to show the meaning of his gospel of the kingdom in relationship to their history. Their history. It's not abstract or theoretical. People who thought they understood this cosmically in my church got it wrong in Detroit. Got it wrong in Detroit. It's got to translate. In the, no, we can't change everything. And there will be no. It is already and not yet. It is not yet. It will never be fulfilled until Christ does it himself. But it's got to be at least a little bit already. <laughs> or they don't really think that we got much to say. If we can't make any of it already at all, they really won't care about our cosmic transactions that don't really change anything in their lives or their history. Thank you. Once again, I'm not sure that we're always talking about the same thing, but hopefully we can talk about the right things, both of us. Um, the concern about the privatization of religion is essential, right on. And uh, I, I wholly agree that uh, the Christianity is always personal, but never merely private. 
And we do sometimes have in our own, our own heritage a, a privatization of, of the gospel and of the claims of Christ that is both dangerous and injurious to the gospel, frankly. It also robs God of his glory, the glory that is to be evident within his church. So there's a lot to repent of there. That doesn't fully explain what the public ministry of the Christian or the church is to be. I actually, I, I love the illustration of Wilberforce, and I, I think it actually makes my point. He makes my point. The Church of England did not put an end to slavery, to the slave trade. Parliament did. Parliament did so because it was persuaded by Christians who argued as Christians. And by the way, having the standing in Parliament was quite important to that. Being in Parliament, ready to make the case for the absolute immorality of the slave trade, based upon Christian premises, we should note, that would be outlawed by the kind of Rawlsian secular debate many want to have today, specifically because they are made in the image of God, as are we, as are all. And thus, slavery is not only that which is immoral, as judged by comparative human societies, is that which is ontologically wrong, because it violates the imago dei. And thus it is wrong for one human being to have a purchase upon another. The church needs to be the body of Christ. The church must be that, which, that, that body that, that shares the gospel, that transforms persons so that they too will come into the kingdom by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and then be made disciples, the kind of disciples who will hate what God hates and love what God loves. But the only way into it is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then Christians need to be deployed, just like Wilberforce, doing what Christians do. Christians need to be where Christians are, doing what Christians are to do. And furthermore, Christians are, the, are to have the ambition to be where Christians can be in every level and sector of society, doing what Christians then are to do, to repair, to reconcile, to do good, to, clean, to clothe, to heal, to give water to the thirsty, to do all of those things, and frankly, to do those things in Christ's name. And to do so precisely because it is not that we are sweeter people than others. It is not that we're even morally superior people to others. It is that we belong to another in whose name we are to do these things. The church has the stewardship of the gospel. And I'll be honest, the concern ought to be not what is done, but what will be left undone. It is not enough that the world say good things about Christians because we do good works. Christ said we are to do those good works in order to glorify our Father who is in heaven. Ultimately, we're the people who need to take every opportunity as the church to proclaim the gospel and to make disciples and to send those disciples out to be the kind of people that lead others to ask, why would they live that way? Why would they love like that? Why would they give as they do? Why would they love and care as they so obviously do? Why do they agitate as they do? <laughs> Why do they irritate as they do? Why do they legislate as they do? Well, all of this is to give glory to God. And it is to be done by those who are the very disciples who are made by the preaching of the word and by the ministry of the church, with the church itself being the body of believers who have come to know the message of the gospel because it is the church that has taught it and proclaimed it and preached it and then applied it. There's a lot of common ground here. The, the hard stuff gets to the questions of definitions, and then it gets hard when you try to actually figure out at the meta level how to accomplish this. That's where Christians of goodwill, equally committed to the gospel and to human flourishing, can find in political and economic and other debates that they have sincere and honest and deep disagreements about how best to serve human flourishing, how best to create the alleviation of suffering. There are big issues to be discussed here, and frankly, we're up to those as well. The church needs to have more conversations when we come together to say, first of all, who are before our eyes that we must serve right now? How is it that we've got to make sure as the church that we're actually doing what we're called to do in preaching the gospel. How are we as Christians to deal with those who are right before our eyes? It's difficult to have this conversation because our vocabulary betrays us if we're careless. Christians are to be about every good work such that the world will see our good works and give praise to our Father who is in heaven. We will give an answer for what we have done and what we have left undone. The church 
will give an answer for any opportunity it had to preach the gospel and did not. Because the only way Christians are deployed in the world to do the things Christians are to do is if the gospel is rightly preached so that God's enemies become his friends and as his friends do the things that God's friends do in a fallen world until Jesus comes. So we each, our last uh, round before, you get to tell us how to do this, right? It's great to say. I, I agree. I wouldn't argue that uh, Wilberforce or King, that churches can establish justice by themselves. That's for sure. Uh, what the Wesley movement did is it put, it, it put believers and put churches on the side of justice. And it inspired justice. And I also agree that there's a huge vocational issue here. Uh, people who, who before us was called to be a parliamentarian. That was a particular vocation within his, the body of Christ. The, the, it was his vocation of that church. They didn't all have that, that vocation. Uh, again, I'll go back to the, I think the most holistic church in American history is the black church. Civil rights movement, here's what they did. You're Montgomery, Alabama, uh, and you're in, a, you're in a bus boycott, beginning of the civil rights movement. And you're tired, and you're worn down. You're trying to figure out how to not take the buses, how to walk to work, how to carpool, how to, how to break this, this system on behalf, because the system was, in fact, it's a theological question here. It's denying the image of God in the black citizens of Montgomery and the church. What does the church do? Well, on Sunday, it holds out the vision, inspires the people, encourages them, makes them strong, gives them courage, and then in the foyer, it organizes the carpools. <laughs> you know, it, it organizes, it, it mobilizes, it, it, it provides a foundation. There would not have been a civil rights movement without the black churches. On the side of justice, every movement, uh, Wilberforce King, needed other people. We made common cause with other folks. But are we on the side of justice? We were in Washington, D.C., mobilizing one of our poverty conferences, and a woman who'd been brought down from New York uh, with a crowd of people, we learned she had been trafficked, victim of trafficking. And she was going to the Hill with us to talk to members of Congress about, about justice. And, and I remember in front of the Cannon Office building, she just broke down and began to cry. It was wrong. She said, if this is what Christians do, I want to become a Christian. It led to Christ in front of the Congress. It didn't happen too often. <laughs> uh, people come to Christ because they see that we're doing this. We care about justice because of Jesus, because of the gospel. And I want to tell you, it is evangelistic. If you want to bring this new generation to Christ, you will not do so just by telling them, telling them the story of salvation as a as it pertains to them personally. You have to show them that you care about the things they care about. And you care about them because that's part of the gospel of the kingdom. But the difference in me and some of those in the more mainstream social gospel movement, I want to bring people to Jesus Christ. Not just be a social gospel. But again, remember, not either or, but both and. I want to, I want to find the opportunity, I'll just say right, right here, I've been uh, going down to, uh, there's, this, there's this new thing happening, all these young people. It's called the Occupy Movement. So I went up to Wall Street to talk to them. And uh, interesting, there's not a, a religious crowd, but there's some kind of God is in the air. They're talking about massive inequality, which, by the way, is a biblical issue. And, 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 and they're, they're interested in talking about Jesus. They actually have this sort of sympathy for Jesus. Particularly when a whole bunch of folks wheeled in a paper mache golden calf, which was a golden bull. <laughs> On the side it read, false idol. And then they began chanting the Beatitudes. 
I've never heard a church chant the Beatitudes. <laughs> this is a whole conversation. Uh, am I endorsing Occupy Wall Street? They wouldn't even endorse each other. <laughs> but I'm embracing and engaging what your churches do. Do what you do in churches. Take down the covered casserole dish. Have a potluck. Sit on the ground. Talk to them. In Grand Rapids last week, I was speaking to a big downtown church. You know, usual kind of thing until the Occupy Grand Rapids. Yes, Grand Rapids. They said, can we come and hear Jim speak? And the church says, sure, we'll give you free tickets if you're with Occupy Grand Rapids. They didn't expect hundreds to come, but they did. And they asked questions about justice. After that, they said, would you talk to us afterwards? And I said, sure. Well, one of my respondents in Grand Rapids to the talk was the mayor of Grand Rapids. He was a Christian, ordained minister, and he stayed. And we sat around, 50 of their leaders, of course, they don't have any leaders, but you know, they're non-leaders. <laughs> and we, they had a talk with me and the mayor of their city for an hour who stayed as a Christian to talk to them. And I asked this tall African-American kid, what do you need from the churches? He said, uh, inspiration. Pastoral counsel, because we've got some broken people here. And presence, just presence, you know. I think there's an opportunity for ministry here with the Occupy kids. There's a chance for evangelism here. If we tell them that we, because of the gospel of the kingdom, we too care about things like economic unfairness, they listen, and what do we talk about? We talk about Jesus. The gospel of the kingdom has the power to transform us, transform our neighborhoods, transform our nations, transform our world, and bring people to Jesus Christ. Now, if I were Jim Wallace, I would do what Jim Wallace just did. And I would go where he just went. Because I think the hardest test case is the African-American church in the United States. And I say that with uh, some personal embarrassment of the last couple of weeks, the obituary of the Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth. Uh, I met Reverend Shuttlesworth when I was an 18-year-old. I was a, a student at Samford University in Birmingham, Alabama, and I was in a special program to, uh, to create leaders. Uh, whether those programs ever do is another question, but nonetheless, I was in it. <laughs> and uh, one of the speakers we had one day was the Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth. And he came in and uh, told... Uh, told us some things that we otherwise would never have heard. He was introduced in terms of the way people introduce speakers. And, you know, quite frankly, when you're an 18-year-old, just in college and all this is happening, you have a speaker one day, you have another speaker the next day, another speaker the next day. Well, several years later that I found out who Fred Shuttlesworth actually was. And I, I found out what he had endured. Uh, I, I found out about bombings. And I found out about attacks. I found out about the injuries to his daughter and the injuries to himself and the, the fear in which he had lived. And then I saw the courage that he had demonstrated in the midst of a civil rights battle the likes of with, which, quite frankly, uh, at the time, must have appeared practically eschatological. Uh, here I was, a generation after that, walking the same streets, but Bull Connor wasn't there with fire hoses. Instead, the uh, fast food restaurants were uh, opening there. Uh, it was a very different world, and yet again, it's the same world. I think the question I want to ask is, how do you end up with people who believe and have such courage to stand up to such injustice? Well, the world has all kinds of heroes who have stood up to injustice and have done mighty and wonderful things, and even when they're not done in the name of Christ, let's be thankful that the right things are done. But when someone stands up so courageously to do something so right in the name of Christ, I want to know how. 
I'm thankful for what the civil rights movement accomplished. I'm thankful for the basic Christian moral instincts that that movement and those who led it, those who followed it represented when the larger church had betrayed its own identity and had brought shame upon the gospel by its own practices, its own complacency, its own prejudices. Well, I'm here tonight because I firmly believe that what created a man like that was the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I firmly believe that even those who led that movement by their own testimony had a concern that certainly was no shorter than the prejudices and injustices they saw before them that they so courageously fought, but was even beyond then with eternal consequences. The gospel is the issue. It's not the only issue in terms of telling people how they can come to know salvation in Jesus Christ. It's not as if our job then is done, but that is the first assignment given to the church. That is the assignment that is invested in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ as it does its work. And the Christians who are then, those who have heard this gospel and believed, are sent out in the world to do all the things we've talked about here. Now, how do we use the word church? Does it mean all Christians? Well, in that case, the church is to be about all kinds of things. The church is to be about the arts. The church is to be about culture. The church is to be about politics. The church is to be about justice and, and the justice system. The church is to be about policing. The church is supposed to be about growing food and distributing it. The church is supposed to be about healing and, and nursing and all the rest of these things. And yes, if we're going to speak of the church in that definition, then there is nothing that the church ought not to do if it is right and righteous. And quite frankly, we need Christians to be doing all of those things and we need the church to be sending out the kinds of Christians who are doing all those things and looking for more in Christ's name. But it's only going to happen if the church, as the church, does that thing which only the church can do. And that is to preach the message of salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord and make disciples. The disciples who will do what disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ will do in a fallen world until he comes. And, and there's more to do than we can possibly do alone. That's why we need to do it together. And Christians need to do things together. But as I said, frankly, we need to do things together, not only with each other, but with those who are not believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. We can't wait when the work needs to be done, when a rescue needs to take place, when an orphan needs to be adopted, when, when someone who has a, a broken body needs to be healed. Those are things that we know we are to respond to and, and act justly and mercifully in right now. As the church always is about the task of preaching the gospel. We can work hand in hand with those who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. And all kinds of good work. And we ought to. But what the church can do. And only the church can do. Is to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. To a world that is not only fallen. And falling. But doomed for destruction. We need to be about restoration and rescue. First and foremost, the restoration and rescue that comes by preaching the gospel so that sinners come to know the salvation that is found in Christ alone. And then get about the task of doing what Christians are supposed to do in a fallen world. I don't want less. I want more. I think our concern should be to make certain that there are more citizens of the city of God because of our charismatic evangelistic ministry of the church in the city of man. And let's be sure that those citizens of a heavenly kingdom, so long as they are on this earth, had better be about the kingdom tasks that the king himself has assigned. We don't want anything less to be done, only far more. But the most important work, that far more, is going to depend upon the church preaching the gospel and not being deterred from preaching the gospel and not being deflected from preaching the only gospel that saves and doing so till Jesus comes. I honestly don't know where else to begin and I don't know where else to end. I think we're to be about all of these tasks, Christians in the world, the church is the vessel of the gospel. You know, I think when you look at these things, our first thoughts so quickly Turn to politics, the headlines, the current events. And there are good debates to be had there. And as I've said, we're up to that. But I think when we gather together as believers, we need to be really, really careful 
that we make certain that the conversation we're having here would make sense in the congregation at Rome to whom Paul preached, amongst the disciples as they banded together after the resurrection and ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ and said, okay, what is it we do and what is it we're supposed to say? And I think we looked in the New Testament, we get all that we need in terms of the marching orders for the church and for disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, now it's time for the Q&A. I was warned that if I gave preachers five minutes, they'd take six, seven, eight. I told you that. That was, that was great. Um, we're going to have uh, someone roaming around with a microphone. When I see them situated, I'll call on you at the appropriate time. I do have some things from uh, Twitter here, and I've got these cards from you folks here, and so I'm going to try to alternate as, I, as we give questions to each of our participants. Let me start with one that came from Twitter here. It's, uh, I'm going to assume it's for... Uh, Jim Wallace, uh, should believers ever partner with non-Christian organizations to fight social injustice? And what would you say about the different uh, suppositions uh, that they use to do that? Should they go ahead and partner with non-Christian organizations? Oh, I, I think uh, on a whole range of things that we care about, uh, we and you all, we, we partner with uh, other faith traditions. Uh, who care about something we care about, and with people who aren't believers at all. Uh, so I would say that sojourners are primary partners, our other faith-based organizations and, and uh, the churches. But sure, we work with, if you're trying to work on youth homicide in your neighborhood, of course you'd work with anybody who cares about youth homicide. They all know why you're doing it. You're doing it because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But if people care about keeping kids from being killed in my neighborhood, I work with them happily. And you, but you never have to extinguish your Christian identity while you do that. In fact, it's better if people know exactly uh, who you are and why you're doing what you're doing. Sure, absolutely. Wilberforce did, King did, of course. Thank you. Um, here's a question. Would you please speak, uh, Dr. Moeller, to what it looks like practically to separate the mission of the church from the mission of the Christian? Yeah, I think practically what it means is that I don't think the church serves itself very well by becoming an, an NGO, a non-governmental organization. Uh, it does its job by deploying Christians who work in them. And uh, for one thing, the church doesn't have the strategy, it doesn't have the intelligence, it doesn't have the means. That, I mean, even if you forget the gospel for a moment as the, as the preeminent issue here, I, we're just not particularly competent at this. Uh, I mean, even when you have Christians start an orphanage, you, you're going to need somebody else to help build the building. Uh, so in other words, I think we need to be honest and say that the difference is the church is not just an NGO. The church is the vessel of the gospel. The, the church is the body and assembly of the redeemed. But those very persons who are made disciples by means of the, of the preaching of the word are the very people who are to be sent out into the world and, and quite frankly, to work with the most competent people uh, doing the most good uh, in the world. Uh, you know, the, the words are, are a little slippery because when we talk about the mission of the church, where the church is to be found, look what, look what the church did in terms of the origins of modern science. You know, you could go, you, all throughout history, you can confuse the categories. But the bottom line is, that, uh, that I, again, the church must not just become an NGO and, and, and take that on. It instead should send people out who work at every level of society, joining with those of goodwill and, uh, and do so in Christ's name. I, I certainly agree with that. But the question, the question here is, should the church, and you're going to be pastors a lot of you, should the church, should pastors preach about justice? Yes. Preach about justice or only about personal salvation. I'm a, you'll be happy to know that I'm now a member of First Baptist in Washington, D.C. I'm now a Baptist. I'm not sure I'm happy, but that's well, okay. A, <laughs> that's, because, that's because it isn't a Southern Baptist church. But at least, at least I'm Baptist. You know, I'm getting close. So uh, Jeff Hagry, my preacher, first black preacher in that church ever, he preaches about justice. 
and he preaches about the culture, the society, and every Sunday after his sermon, he gives a personal invitation to salvation and discipleship every Sunday. Uh, or should the churches, we shouldn't be an NGO, absolutely not. We should work with NGOs, but should our ministries be all ministries also of justice and movements, or should they be just ministries about personal salvation? So there's, you have two people here who believe in personal salvation, and I want to say that not all the churches anymore do. I still do. Uh, and yet I think churches also should preach about just Fred Shuttleworth believing in personal salvation. And he preached from his pulpit about salvation in Christ and about justice in Alabama. Uh, so to me, it, you know, the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom is about all of that, all of that, at the local and national church level. Yeah, may I respond to that just for a moment? Sure. I'll ask my own question. Um, yeah, I, and Jim, when I hear you say that, I, I just want to come back to say that I believe with all my heart that the best way I know to express that is that, of course, the church is to preach justice because the church is to preach the whole counsel of God. Mm -hmm. I believe in expository preaching, which means you start the book and you go on and you preach on every single verse that's in there. And uh, that, that keeps you from avoiding the verses you don't want to preach on. Yeah. And, uh, and, and the church, therefore, is going to be armed, therefore, to know what justice is and how to act justly by the preaching of the word, then go out in society and do it. Uh, I think one other acknowledgement that has to be made here, and, and this, is, this is a hard one, is that the church at times must take sides. They don't have to take sides on everything. Uh, we don't have to have a church vote on the flat tax. It does have to take sides where the historical circumstances call for it. And that can happen on what you might say the political left and the right. It can happen over racism. It can also happen over whether or not we have any distinctive revelation of God to which we're accountable on issues of sexuality. Mm -hmm. uh, but the church needs to take sides publicly on an issue like that only where the church must take sides. Really? That's a hard fear and trembling kind of issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are there microphones? Question for you. Um, it seems like both of you have been using the term the gospel of the kingdom or the gospel of Jesus, but I kind of get the feeling that you're both using it a little bit differently. So could both of you kind of clarify a little bit of what you mean? I know that's a really big question, but even just give us a little bit of a feel for what the difference is here. You want to go first? Sure. Um, uh, well, I, I, I uh, when I was here at, at Trinity, uh, <laughs> I was known for, uh, I kidded about this a lot. If I had soteriology or I had uh, eschatology, ecclesiology, my paper would inevitably be the social implications of soteriology, <laughs> eschatology, because I, I felt that wasn't being adequately addressed. So, uh, you know, when John Stott was here, that semester he was here when I was here, uh, he was in the process of the Lausanne movement. And John was saying, that justice is integral to the gospel. John Stott believed uh, in personal salvation by the blood of Jesus Christ, absolutely. But he also thought that, that justice was integral to the gospel. So when I say gospel, I mean gospel of the kingdom, and I laid it out. It includes uh, this new order of the kingdom that came to break in. The Sermon on the Mount was the catechetical tool the early church used to instruct converts about what the gospel meant. It meant living this way, living this way. It meant proclam proclamation and transformation. Uh, and the resurrection was sort of the affirmation of, of this inbreaking of the new order. So I mean uh, inclusive of uh, the teachings of Christ, inclusive of justice, which is throughout the whole scriptures. It's inclusive of that. That's not sort of an add-on or an extracurricular or a secondary or something that happens. The gospel is, and I'm right here with the global evangelical movement, which really is talking about the integral gospel, not uh, a personal gospel over here and then implications of that over here. That justice is integral to the gospel itself. 
That's what I'm saying. And that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> and, uh, and, and there is a very clear disagreement. Uh, I do believe what the New Testament presents is the gospel and its implications. Uh, if we're just talking about good news, well, from a, from a Christian perspective based in Scripture, there's nothing in Scripture that's not good news. Children obey your parents is good news. It may not appear good news to the child, but, it, but it's good news. Everything God has revealed for our good is good news, and everything he has revealed is for our good. And, and, and so there is, there is no end to the goodness of the, the comprehensive revelation of God uh, in Scripture and in Christ. But when the apostles preach the gospel, the, that which Paul said, woe unto me if I preach not, I mean, we have the apostolic record in the New Testament, and the gospel is about how sinners who rightly deserve nothing but the eternal condemnation of God nonetheless are redeemed by his decisive act in Jesus Christ to redeem sinners. It's about our response to God's act in Christ on our behalf, that response of belief. And, and then we talk about faith and the justification that, uh, that comes by faith alone, in Christ alone. And, and then it, it also talks about then what the Christian, having been saved, uh, is. And, and who is that Christian? The good news of the gospel, that Christian is a citizen of a heavenly kingdom. That Christian is now an ambassador of reconciliation. And, and thus, the gospel produces Christians. And then the implications, I don't know any other way to put it, just based in the New Testament, there are implications to the gospel. There are implications that are private. There are implications that are incredibly public. I don't think there's any list to the, uh, the end to the list of the implications of the gospel. And in a fallen world right now, and this already but not yet, let's be honest, we need the communion of the saints in order to figure out what are the implications of the gospel and how is it we need to be getting about these things right now to be faithful. What is, difference is this going to make in my sex life? What difference is the gospel going to make in my marriage? What difference is the gospel going to make in my set of priorities? How will I be a different consumer because of the gospel? How, how, how is my political life going to be different? All of that is the implication that follows the gospel that produces Christians by the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, well, what do we make then of Jesus' opening statement, mm -hmm. his mission statement, mm -hmm. where he began, first words he ever said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight of the blind. Set the oppressed go, let the oppressed go free and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, which is the Jubilee year, which has all kinds of implications for economic justice and fairness. What does that mean if that's his mission statement? Shouldn't it be our mission statement too? Well, Jim, I just have to wonder, then was Christ incompetent? Because that's not what happened. If we mean by that that Christ came in order that the poor would no longer be poor economically, in order that all the captives wrongly imprisoned would be set free. That's not what it says. It says bring good news to the poor, proclaim. It doesn't say accomplishing all of this. It says it says to do this, to okay. preach this, to act this. To, you know, this well, is you're headed where I was trying to head, actually, which is that that is what the church is supposed to do. That's different than saying that the church, as the church, is going to accomplish in the name of the gospel other than the proclamation of these things. It says to bring good news to the poor. That's proclaiming it. Are, and, we, working, and, are, are we arguing and, over verbs? No, and bringing it. <laughs> I think we are. Well, I think there's a difference. In, yeah, there's a verb here. It's called bring it. You know, bring good news to the poor. I don't, I don't fault the church. Well, define that. It would well, help me if you define what you think that means then. I don't, I don't, I don't fault the church for not uh, accomplishing the kingdom of God yet in Chicago. Mm -hmm. it, it couldn't do that with the present mayor anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I know this guy. He used to be in Washington. Uh, but Bethel New Life on the west side of Chicago CCDA down in Lawndale, uh, what they're doing is they are bringing good news to the poor every single day. They're bringing health and wellness and jobs and fairness. They're bringing, they're bringing good news to poor people. And, and in the middle of that, they proclaim Christ. 
and people come to Christ because they see the good well, news. Well, what is the good news they're bringing if it isn't Christ? They're bringing health care to people who don't have it. That's good news to people who are poor and don't have health care. Okay, I want them to have health care, but I don't think that's what the text is talking about. Well, the text, the text doesn't say, and by good news, all I mean is, Personal salvation doesn't say that. And no, nor have I said that. I've been clear. It. it means Christians need to be out in the world fighting for those things, advocating for those things. Well, but, but bring, this is what Jesus said his mission was. All I'm saying, is this not the mission of the church as well? Jim, there's a question here that speaks to this issue. Maybe it'll help to clarify things. Maybe not. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, which, which is to have priority, good works or proclamation? Both are necessary, this person says. Both of, both of you seem to agree. But which is to have priority? Which is to come first? Which creates the other? But so, yeah, this is the conversation that's been going on now for a long time. That when, again, John Stott was here, he talked about, Luzon talks about. It's not a matter of... of of balance, that's the wrong word, or priority, or for a second, it's integral. What's integral to the gospel itself? That's the disagreement here. Uh, we would both say, uh, you would say that much of what I'm saying is important, but that's kind of secondary. No, um, it's, it is what follows as Christians by the gospel having been made Christians by the gospel, then are faithful. So Jesus started with his secondary concerns. That, you're, uh, you, you just refuted what I said. I, they are not secondary concerns. The question is, how is it that people are produced who will do these things? It's by the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, I want to tell you, the people who talked about personal salvation most in this country during the 50s and 60s, who talked about the atonement the most, more of those people per square foot were in the American South and in apartheid South Africa. They talked about that primacy of personal salvation. That was, that was the gospel. And they got it wrong when it came to race. Because Paul, they didn't ever tell me. They weren't making Paul, disciples. But Paul's missionary journey I never heard in my preaching, had a lot to do with the issue of, um, uh, of reconciling Jews and Gentiles. It was race. Absolutely. R racism was, there was a big battle about who was going to get to be Christians. And, uh, and so Paul was clearly on the side of uh, this church being uh, no respecter of persons, Jew and Gentile, male and female, bond and free. And so, you know, if you were a woman, or if you were uh, uh, poor or an oppressed race, uh, this is good news, this new community. Because here, we're going to be treated in a whole different way. You know? mm -hmm. So that was essential, integral to the gospel itself. And I'm saying, a church that, I mean, just speaking again personally, 14 years old, 15 years old, the big issue in my city, what's ripping my city apart, is racism. And the elder says, Christianity has nothing to do with that. Our gospel is personal, that's political. It didn't evangelize me, it made me leave. It made me leave. It's made droves of young people leave. If you want young people to come back to faith, you better be concerned about the world in which they live and not just about your concern about their personal salvation, but when they ask about what I was raised to say, you know, that. Uh, you know, uh, Jesus loves little children. All children were red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in the sight. In my sight, all I saw was white people. Okay, we have you another know. question. So oh, that was a gospel issue <laughs> that turned respond? me away. It turned me away from the yeah. church. Okay, let, let's get a one-minute response, and then we'll get a question back here. Yeah, uh, Jim, I want to see more of what you're talking about than I think your method here will produce. Uh, because I think the only way that happens is if the church is very clear about what the gospel is in order to produce believers, those who are Christians purchased with a price, those who have been justified by faith, those who have been forgiven of their sins. I can't deal with your childhood preacher. That's, that's beyond my ability. The privatization here is not, the preaching of the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ is never merely privatistic. 
It immediately, again, the Great Commission is not only about preaching the gospel and, and creating believers or converts, it's about making disciples. The failure you're talking about in the church that preached the atonement, you said, but then said it was merely privatistic, is that it wasn't making disciples. It was preaching a, a gospel that was not biblical. It did not lead to the making of disciples. Its disciples are going to do that. I want to get to kingdom pictures. I want to get to that future. But I believe it's only going to come by citizens of the kingdom who only come into the kingdom by means of the gospel who then become faithful disciples and do what kingdom people do. Okay, that's, a, that's wonderful. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Uh, here's what I want to do. We're pushing a little bit past time. I'm enjoying what's going on here. And if, if you don't mind, we're going to take three questions. One in the back here, one here, and one over here. And then we're going to call it an evening, okay? So just so everybody knows what we're doing. What do we have in the back? First, I just want to say I'm very happy to hear that both of you do believe that it is a responsibility of Christians to address social issues and to be involved. And it sounds like it's simply a matter of what uh, two things. One, what the gospel is and where these things are supposed to take place. Um, one of my concerns is that I think that I hear a little bit from Dr. Moeller, a little bit of a dualistic view of humanity. Um, and let me explain. Um, Christ is head of the church, his body. When I think of Christ ministering while he was still here in his body, when he went, sometimes he would feel, heal first and then say, your sins are forgiven. Sometimes he would first say, your sins are forgiven, get up and walk. He even held his own Occupy <laughs> the temple. Um, he, uh, so we do see that Jesus, sometimes he cast out demons. There were very, very many ways that he approached people, sometimes first by conversation, woman at the well. If we say that the gospel is simply the salvation bringing simply, and, and again, even salvation, as you know, translated sometimes healing, sometimes delivered, you know, not a simple translation, singular translation of even that. So my concern would be if we make the gospel dualistic in which you get saved over here, but you get healed and all your other needs met over here, are we not taking apart the very fiber of our, our humanness and also approaching the gospel in a manner differently than Jesus approached it? Great question. And I will, I will simply have to come back to say, we are Christ's people, but we do not have the power that he had to heal, to exercise, and to accomplish these things. We do not. I cannot make the lame walk. I can't. I, I can proclaim that it will happen, but you know that, that is beyond what I can do right now. I can preach the gospel, and I can, I can do what I can as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ to alleviate suffering. And if, if there could be surgery to fix that, that would be wonderful. But I do not have the capacity right now in the sharing of the gospel to do what Christ did. I have to follow the example of the apostles in the New Testament. Here you have a basic biblical authority question. Are the disciples doing what Christ sent them to do? And is the New Testament actually giving us a picture of, of what Christianity is to look like? Because if not, we have a bigger problem here. We are to do, as I said, Christians are to be out doing everything they can to heal, to, to resolve, to reconcile. But we cannot do, in, I mean, just to take the record of the Gospels, and I just, again, show me, show me in the New Testament, from the book of Acts onward, where, where the church says we can do just that in the same way. Instead, the church proclaims the message of a kingdom that is here and not yet fully here, in order that more people may be citizens of that kingdom. But the church, though, even in its, uh, it, the limited context of not having democracy and parliamentarian possibilities like Wilberforce, I would say when the church was reordering the economic life of the body of Christ, those who had shared, women were empowered to participate, uh, Jews and Gentiles remained e equals, that was establishing justice in the midst of injustice. Partial you justice. Know, well, it's always partial. It's always yes. partial. Martin Luther King Jr. didn't create Total, he was partial justice. That's Desmond right. Tutu. But we got to be on the, we at least be on the side of partial justice. Well, I and mean, where Christ's people are found, yeah. that must be what is evident. But my concern is where, 
my, my concern about the theology that defines the gospel solely as personal salvation, that doesn't generally... It isn't solely as personal. You keep that, twisting that. It's that, that personal salvation that creates disciples. Go and make disciples, teaching them. You read it yourself. To observe all that I've commanded Including you. the teachings of Christ as a part of what's being taught. Yes. Right. So where the gospel is integral, where justice is integral to the gospel, see, I'm, I'm, I am as opposed to the kind of mainstream 19th century uh, liberal social gospel where there's no more conversion, no more salvation. It's just some kind of social gospel. I'm opposed to that now in some mainline churches where there's no more uh, I give them a hard time. There's no conversion left there. But I'm also concerned about where the gospel isn't, where justice isn't integral to it, particularly in an affluent, rich, uh, privileged society that generally has led to, uh, dangerously, to a private gospel that doesn't address the issues Jesus did in his Nazareth Mount. Well, the problem with that and with integralism, and it's a big problem, and it's deeply rooted primarily in Roman Catholic moral thinking, and I understand that, and I understand how some evangelicals are borrowing it, is that there's nothing revealed in Scripture that isn't integral to the gospel. That means our sex lives and what we do with our sex lives is integral to the gospel. It means that our economic lives and everything we do in our economic lives would then be integral to the gospel. Well, the problem is then the gospel just becomes everything revealed in Scripture. And, and that just doesn't fit the New Testament model of the apostolic preaching of the gospel. The gospel then produces the people who live out the implications of all that Scripture teaches. Yeah, but you, well, this, we'll, we'll stay up and talk later. Right. <laughs> do, you, do you have a one, 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 one sentence question here, if you would? This is a question for uh, Jim Wallace. Um, Acts uh, 6, verse 2 says, It is not right that the 12th, the apostle said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. I'd like you to comment on that. And here's a, one quick question. Sometimes preaching Christ is, uh, becomes an obstacle to missions and social justice. Um, if that happens, what would you do? Like, for example, uh, Campus uh, Crusade for Christ, they, they eliminated the name of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, for the sake of missions, what would you do in that situation? Well, the first situation, you were talking about just a division of labor in the ministry of the church, deacons to, to take care of table service and all the rest. That's just, there are, there's a, uh, many gifts and there's a division of labor in the church. That's, that's not a problem. No, I, 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 have, I, have, I have been in movements for justice all of my life. And I've never had to, never uh, begun to, never been forced to uh, give up the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is, uh, my mentors are people like Desmond Tutu and Martin Luther King Jr. and Wilberforce and all the rest and John Stott and all the rest. Uh, no, I don't think we should do that. We don't have to do that. Uh, I just think that we, we have got to, and I want to be held by what the New Testament says. But in my church, we skipped the synoptics altogether, went right to John, and then to Romans. Now, I want a full exposition of the scriptures, and the New Testament, I think, supports a broader, fuller notion of the gospel of the kingdom than my dear friend and brother is talking about tonight. We have a different view of what the New Testament's saying. But I think practically, yes. practically, we're going to probably have a lot of common ground. But I think it's dangerous, particularly in, in, uh, in this kind of society, to, in my experience, to restrict the gospel to just the proclamation of the saving grace of God in Christ and the atonement. I think that's central to my theology. But I think justice is critical. And the reason this topic came up, this isn't esoteric. It was in the literature I got from you, quoting one of our amazing theologians in this country, his name is Glenn Beck, who said, <laughs> who said, if your church has on their website the term social justice 
or the preacher says it out loud, or preaches justice. You run as fast as you can from that church. And then he put, you know, the social justice Christian named Jim Wallace on his blackboard every night. And, and what he was saying clearly was, what he was saying was, I don't want to hear about justice. We solve poverty, those questions, through private charity alone. That's what he was saying. It's just, that's the danger here. When there's no justice, it's private charity. And that is not biblical. The God of the Bible is a God of justice and not a God of charity. Would you like last, one last response? And well, then I'm I think not we'll about close. to take out the case of Glenn Beck. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, the, the way you ended, total agreement. The hard questions are what's behind that. And you spoke of what you're afraid of, and I'll speak of what I'm afraid of. And just be honest, I'm afraid that the gospel, as preached by the apostles, is going to be lost out of a concern to do good. I don't want any less good to be done. I only want that one thing that is even better to be done in order that even more of the first will be done by God's people. I want to talk about justice. I want to talk about it the way the Bible in the New Testament says the apostles first of all talked about it. It's how that God's justice would ever explain how we as unjust sinners become justified. And then those who have been justified had better be the people who understand justice and its imperatives in a whole new light and do so precisely because we're going to face a just and righteous and merciful God. And uh, Christ's people are the people who better be deployed and will be deployed if they understand the gospel in every dimension of life. That's a fair question and that, that, um, that a concern for just will produce uh, the social gospel movements where conversion was dropped altogether. I think it's a fair concern and that's why it's sojourners. I have fought our, our whole 40 years to have, have, have personal salvation central in our proclamation of the gospel. My fear, on the other, other uh, side, uh, that's a fair fear, okay? Uh, my fear is that if we are not justice people because of being Jesus people, we will turn more and more people away from Jesus Christ as I was turned away. That's my fear. And I want to say... <laughs> I think, if I could remember your words, I, I would repeat them. I would just want to say, in addition to that, that we need to be Jesus people in order to be truly, lastingly, justice people. And when I talk about... And when I talk about conversion, I'll be real careful to say that's the conversion of the sinner by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone to a completely different status by the grace and mercy of God, justified. Not merely a conversion, and I, I didn't hear you define it, from one way of life to another, merely transformation. It is that New Testament conversion that produces genuine Christians who then are obligated to everything Christ taught. If this whole room, if this whole room believed and acted on Jesus' people becoming justice people, it could change the world. Amen. Amen. With that. Well, it's been quite an evening tonight. I know I've learned a lot. Um, a little you. known fact about me is I grew up on the south side of Chicago. I know what it means to, to live with people who cry out for justice. I then traveled in my travels. I ended up in Europe doing a PhD. And I know what it means to have a lot of churches that are empty, that preach only a social message. Um, and so somewhere in the middle here, we're going to have to find a way forward together. And I just want to thank them for raising this question, joining us here tonight. And uh, why don't we just give them a warm uh, applause here.